Yeah, I would just think like anybody would be wise to keep me in a good role. Greg the motherfucking egg. Oh Machiavellian fuck. I see you, Greg. I like it. Hell yeah. In my humble opinion, HBO's Succession is the best active TV show, and it earns that status despite the fact that the vast majority of characters are unlikable Machiavellian connivers and cutthroats. Succession is by no means the first show to cross the boundary of unlikability and portray a cast of characters with questionable grasps on morality. We may even get a cathartic kick out of observing the bloodthirsty antics of the members of the Roy family and their lackeys lingering around the peripheries, but the wicked charm of the Roy family's cutthroat cunning begins to exceed the threshold of acceptable moderation fairly soon into the show. After about a few episodes, you may grow tired of the perpetual disagreeableness of their morals, or lack thereof. A vacuum opens up then for a more relatable character we can identify with, and through which the show's various schemes and power plays can become more palatable. A rabid hunger for such a character arises, and the only character that can reasonably satisfy such a role is none other than Greg the Egg. Out of all of those admitted entrants into the Roy's inner circle, Greg is the most genuine, or so he seems. The primary question that arises as the show goes on is if Greg is indeed genuine or if his harmless facade is simply a smokescreen for the inner Machiavelli brewing within. This is the question I'm going to be exploring in this video. If you're curious of and want to hear some of my more general thoughts on Succession and why I believe it's the best current show on TV, I will leave cards above for some of my previous videos on the show and I will leave the links for them in the description. For a show as captivating as Succession is, it's surprising to think of how a great quantity of the characters are flat arced. With the possible exception of Kendall, it's very rare for a succession character to be thrown through the ringer of emotional conflict, learn legitimate lessons from it, and emerge a fundamentally different, and dare I say, better person. In regards to the Roy siblings, this may be a tactic on the part of the writers to highlight their inherent entitlement. It may also be an attempt to illustrate the general moral bankruptcy of the corporate setting the characters operate in. But regardless of the true intention, this decision provides a compelling background for the arc of one specific character, and that character is of course none other than Greg the Egg. Greg does have an arc, but it isn't exactly a positive one, and it isn't an arc that's going to leave him with a storybook ending, but it is an arc that sees him elevated from vomiting in his mascot costume to negotiating deals with the devil in a slick suit at a Tuscan villa. In terms of the way the Roys and the corporate class of folk rubbing shoulders with them define success, Greg's arc is a positive one, flush with the cornucopia of perks acquired with the trait of corporate treachery. But how exactly did Greg make his corporate and character leap? Was he corrupted by his association with his uncle and his cousins? Or was he a sly Machiavellian maneuverer all along? Long before Greg hatched into the role of legitimate power player who courts obscure European heiresses and mocks the idea of having a soul, he was a bit of a ne'er-do-well. Many may be tempted to look at the way he jostled his lanky build into the Roy family compound and determine that he had Machiavellian impulses from the very beginning. I think a fair argument can be made from this, but in my view, the seeds of Greg's Machiavellian tendencies were planted in the first episode when he was given a taste of the Roy family's lavish lifestyle. Those seeds have been sown, and while they still probably haven't blossomed fully, they've grown enough to the point where Greg can discard his soul and enter into a Faustian bargain without too much inner conflict holding him back. The portrait the creators of Succession offer us of Greg in the first episode is one of minimally content lethargy. Greg works at one of the Waystar parks, but is devoid of ambition. 
An interesting nugget from our first interaction with Greg is his reluctance to tell people who exactly he is and reveal his relation to Logan and the Roys. This reluctance, coupled with the fact that Greg never sought to contact Logan or any of his cousins prior to this, leads me to the conclusion that the scheming, conniving Greg we see at the end of Season 3 is not who he was at the start of the show, but rather who he became due to the influences around him. When Greg does get his shot to speak to Logan, after only just a measly taste of the luxury of the Roy lifestyle, he tries to weasel his way into a position running one of the parks. Greg had a shot to pitch to Logan, but he came up short. He didn't have any leverage, no legs to stand on. But that will change as the first season goes along. Before we go any further, I want to clarify what exactly I mean when I say Machiavellian. The term refers to the 15th century Florentine diplomat Niccolo Machiavelli, a man who associated with the infamous Borgia family and earned a reputation as a crafty statesman. Today, the term that bears his name has adopted a sinister connotation, one linking it to the many villains and scoundrels of history. After all, he is the man known for such quotes as, The ends justify the means, and it is better to be feared than loved. Many have noted that Machiavelli's repugnant reputation is a bit of an embellishment of sorts. Those two quotes, for instance, the two quotes he is arguably most well known for, are almost exclusively taken out of their proper context. But, despite any exaggerations on his character, there is undeniably a ruthless streak to Machiavelli's political philosophy. Merriam-Webster defines the adjective birth from Machiavelli's work as, quote, using clever lies and tricks in order to get or achieve something, clever and dishonest. This definition is generally accepted and comes with a bit of baggage, one such carry-on being the image of a strongman politician or of a stoic, conniving advisor or confidant. We usually think of a Machiavellian person as being calm, composed, calculated. To put it lightly, Gregory Hirsch is none of those things, at least not on the surface. Appearance-wise, Greg is awkward, meek, indecisive, bumbling, blundering, and bungling. At no point in his journey to the bottom of the top does Greg present himself as a dependable or reliable cog in the Waystar system. He's the poster child of reluctant nepotism, and that makes him a perfect Machiavellian hierarchy climber. First off, and most importantly, Greg's buffoonish nature is not faked or forced. Unless he's really pulling the wool over everyone's eyes, that is his genuine self, and not having the burden and pressures of projecting a false persona are definitely to Greg's advantage. Greg's genuine self also has the advantage of passing him through the upper chains of command as a perpetual non-threat. Greg the Egg is the very last person anyone at Waystar would expect to discover with a dagger in his hand. Before the Contessas and Faustian bargains enter the picture, Greg has already been set up with the ideal tool belt for executing his future Machiavellian plots. Despite his last name, Greg has Roy blood in him. And those Roy family predispositions towards deception, conniving, and power hungriness lie dormant within him, embryonic traits incubating until Greg's actions match his desires. On the subject of Roy Blood, the only Roy that Greg has regular contact with up until the events of the show is his grandfather Ewan Roy, Logan's older brother. Ewan's values, lifestyle, and principles are diametrically opposed to Logan's. Ewan might even be the most likable character on the show if he was actually a regular character on the show and if he wasn't so grumpy all the time. Regardless, he's still the most morally sound character on Succession by a long shot, and he tries his best to wrangle Greg into his morally conscious way of thinking and away from the insidious nest of vipers that is the Roy family. Ewan warns his grandson, 
but he still greatly underestimates him. He doesn't just underestimate his ability to function in society, but also his potential to become one of the deadliest vipers in the Roy Nest. And perhaps even as a dark horse candidate to become Logan's successor. Unknowingly, Ewan even offers some room for Greg's Machiavellian instincts to flourish. Ewan severing Greg from his will and funneling the money instead to Greenpeace summoned up the gall within Greg to sue a charitable organization to claim his inheritance after boldly crossing the firm boundary set by his grandfather of quitting Waystar. And like the closeted Machiavellian he is, Greg is using some clever, albeit dishonest and dubious legal tactics to win back his inheritance. Greg tries to get his cake and eat it too. His lawsuits against Greenpeace see him calibrating his moral compass to the Roy family setting, attempting to hoard all the resources he can by playing to Logan while attempting to siphon his inheritance away from the philanthropic endeavors it's been reallocated for. Ewan tried to steer his grandson away from moral bankruptcy by using money as an incentive. Greg, now molded into a first-rate opportunist and smelling blood in the water, bets on Logan, foreseeing great prosperity ahead. A piece of advice Ewan gave to his grandson back in Season 1 may inadvertently have been a factor nudging Greg towards Logan and the allure of lavish living. That fateful word of advice from Ewan was, Paddle your own canoe. In my view, this is perhaps the most consequential piece of guidance offered to Greg in the entire series, and in typical Greg fashion, he takes it and applies it in the totally wrong context. What I believe Ewan meant by paddling your own canoe was to give Greg a warning about the fleeting nature of uber wealth and the ultimate emptiness it can leave you with. That bountiful lifestyle of extravagance is a siren's song, and that is incredibly difficult to ignore, and thus most are called toward it and paddle collectively in its direction. Ewan is telling Greg to paddle against the current of the crowd, toward a destination that is bare bones by comparison, but spiritually enriching, towards morality. Based off his actions, Greg takes his grandfather's advice as a call towards sharpening his Machiavellian instincts, from that point on, Greg is primarily concerned with looking after number one and ensuring that he will no longer do any more dirty work for free. Before hearing his grandfather's advice, Greg shredded evidence of corporate wrongdoing as Tom's pawn. After hearing his advice, he began using his stash of incriminating papers and his status as a Roy family errand boy as leverage for ascending the ranks of the company hierarchy. Greg will continue to paddle his canoe into the river Styx, but he will do so as its captain and only passenger. Interestingly, in the episode where Greg receives the advice from his grandfather, the audience is presented with a stark juxtaposition. Ewan attempts to appeal to Greg's sense of morality in a dingy dive where he has to resort to the shame of world hunger to get Greg to simply eat his meal. In the scene that follows immediately after, Greg is wined and dined by Tom at a fancy restaurant where the perks of the material lifestyle don't have to be spoken of, only observed. The way the director presented these two contrasting scenes is in a way framing a pivotal decision for Greg that carries implications for his character development into future seasons. Will Greg do the right thing? and conceal his grandfather's planned attendance at the bear hug meeting? Or will he tell Tom, after Tom took him out to sharpen his palate and confided in him? Even the title of the episode, Whose Side Are You On?, is very telling. It is the appeal towards Greg's dormant longing for money and power, and an appeal towards mutually beneficial corporate alliance that wins the bumbling giant over and he informs Tom about the no-confidence vote. It's a big step forward for Greg, a turning point in his character arc, and it's only just the beginning.
As Greg was afforded time to acclimate himself to the Waystar corporate climate, he grew more accustomed to Machiavellian anglings, and gradually he became more competent in his dealings. By the time we leave him in Season 3, it's safe to say that Greg has become a Roy. He seems to be quite happy and satisfied with his devilish deal and where he finds himself. And in a way, we're happy for him. Happy to see the perennial underdog carve a slice of the pie out for himself. But we're also wary of him treading down such a treacherous path. Regardless, the path of the manipulative Machiavellian materialist is the one that Greg chooses, and throughout the next two seasons, he quietly becomes quite adept at traversing that path. In the business world, Greg uses his minuscule leverage to great effect, securing solid footing for himself at Waystar. Greg also makes Machiavellian moves in his dating life, as he uses Comfrey as leverage to get closer to the Contessa at the wedding. The Machiavellian sequence in his Roy DNA has been fully catalyzed by the time Season 3 ends. We know what he wants, and while he still hasn't been able to shake his inherent awkwardness, he has developed the confidence needed to stand up for himself. But no Machiavellian can be effective without the mutually beneficial relationships needed to sustain them. And for Greg, that key relationship is the one he shares with Tom. If we track back the timeline of their relationship, we can get a clear look at Greg's Machiavellian trajectory and even catch a glimpse of what may be in store for Greg's future. At the beginning of their relationship, it was clear that Tom held the keys of power. Greg was a stumbling, fumbling newbie to business and relied on Tom for any crumbs of guidance or help he could offer. Tom, in turn, used Greg as a lapdog to dispose of the cruise's mess, and while Greg has leveled up in his deception, it's clear from Tom's actions and metaphors that he still views Greg as that same harmless lapdog. But I don't believe that this is really the case. Whether either party knows it or not, the tables of power in their relationship have turned, and I would argue that Greg occupies the seat of power now. And the reason why is that Tom has grown dependent upon Greg. The reason why may be confusing if we judge the situation solely off of Tom's posturing, but his dependence upon Greg's fellowship grows as the show goes along. In Season 2, Tom grows slightly jealous when Greg is courted by Kendall, and in Season 3, whenever Tom is suffering through a moment of darkness or celebrating the high of not going to prison, it is Greg with who he shares his inner thoughts with. Tom trusts his deepest feelings with Greg, and not Shiv. Tom's affection and friendship with Greg is founded on their shared outsider status in the family. Going forward onto Season 4, Tom will only have to become more dependent on that affection from Greg as his marriage to Shiv enters perilously rocky waters. Tom may have secured his spot in the upper echelons of Waystar Royco, but without Greg at his side, he will have no one. That consideration may have been a deciding factor in Tom cutting Greg into his deal with the devil in the first place. We've already seen the vicious depths Tom is willing to sink to when Greg threatens to leave him. Whether he did it intentionally, Greg successfully pulled off a Machiavellian coup by making Tom, a top player in the firm, completely dependent on him. Greg accomplished this partly through his cruise's leverage, but more insidiously through his personal bond with Tom. This dependence landed Greg a coveted deal with the devil, and very likely will continue to pay dividends into Season 4. And if we wanted to speculate further and more specifically into Season 4, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility for us to see Greg betray Tom at some point in that future. I talked about this possibility at length in one of my previous Succession videos, a video specifically about Tom, but to sum it up, the reasoning driving this theory is Greg's resentment of Tom and the suboptimal ways Tom has treated him over the course of the show's three seasons. Even though Tom has essentially displaced his wife, in favor of his new Sporus, 
It is incredibly unlikely that Greg will simply forget the times Tom treated him poorly and without respect and took him for granted. I believe Tom genuinely cares for Greg, but regardless, he still asserts his dominance over Greg, showing him his true nasty colors. Reminding a subordinate of their inferior status constantly will naturally breed resentment and lengthen that subordinate's memory. With an ever-growing power and sense of self-respect and a new gluttonous taste for the finer things in life, I would predict a future Greg betrayal of Tom if the right circumstances were to align. To quote Niccolo Machiavelli, The injury that we do to a man must be such that we need not fear his vengeance. To quote Machiavelli further, Men must either be treated generously or destroyed. We could argue that Tom treats Greg generously, but his slights against Greg and constant need to be the dominant party in the relationship could very well come back to bite him when the closeted Machiavellian Greg consolidates enough power for the lapdog to bite back. At the end of the day, I don't think Greg is a bad person. In fact, I think he is an inherently good person, but he's also a very impressionable person and was ultimately soiled by his close proximity to his great uncle and his Roy cousins. Living adjacently to such extreme wealth and power, and in having his strides and shadiness being positively reinforced by members of the Roy inner circle, specifically Tom and Kendall, Greg went from a humble, meek outsider with a naive fondness for California Pizza Kitchen to a capable Machiavellian power player with a shot at the dormant throne of Italy. Greg has come a long way, and he still has a long way to go, but he has a potent weapon stashed away in his arsenal, and that weapon is the element of surprise. Greg is discounted constantly and very easily, but over the course of the last few seasons, he's been paying attention and growing into his Roy heritage giving him the potential to be a player in the future of Waystar and the Roy family, and perhaps even a sleeper contender for the Waystar throne.